All right. So next up, uh, we have Mariah Meyer. And are you? Um, Mariah is a professor at, uh, at the uh, University of Utah, and I, I, would, I would wager is the only astrophysicist in this room. Oh, this way. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, hi, my name is Mariah, and uh, like Caddy, I have the privilege of getting to compress 45 hours of lecture content in 45 minutes. So my strategy was just to have one slide per hour of lecture content. <laughs> Don't worry, I, I'm, I'm kidding. Okay, so um, so uh, so Caddy just did a really wonderful job of contextualizing what we as visualization researchers think about how we view the world, what we think about data, and how we start thinking about building visualizations. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to complement what she talked about with a really deep dive into some nitty gritty details about some of the basic foundational building blocks behind visualization design. Um, so to start, um, I get to work with an amazing group of students and postdocs. I co-run the visualization design lab at the University of Utah. And what we really think about as a group is we think about how do we apply visualization techniques and methods to real problems in the world. Um, and so there we design um, usually very bespoke tools for people in a variety of domains from biology to air quality to poetry. Um, but then what we also think about as visualization designers is how do we learn from that process of designing out in the real world? How can we think about new methods and methodologies to make the work that we do more rigorous and more valid? Um, and so, so that's sort of the, the, the perspective that I come from. And one of the things I care very, very deeply about is about codifying the design process itself. And that's, and that's some of what I'm going to give you a flavor of today. Okay, so what I'm going to go over is building off of what Caddy already laid the foundations for, is we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about what we mean by data types from a visualization perspective, as well as these encoding channels or the visual variables. Then I'm going to, uh, and we'll do a few exercises around that. So be prepared. If you're feeling a little low energy, go get a cup of coffee. You will be required to participate. Um, I'll give you a few just very brief like nuggets of some guidelines that you can go off and use right away. Um, and then at the end, hopefully we'll have time, um, I'll talk a little bit about the visualization design process itself. Okay, so let's dive in. So data types and encodings. So the first thing here though is to, is to talk about what's the difference between type and semantic, okay? Um, so if I were to show you this, uh, this row of data, to basal 7s pair. Question is, how do you interpret basal? Any, how, how might you interpret basal? Any thoughts? Somebody's name. Somebody's name. OK, great. Any other thoughts? Food, herb. Food, herb. OK. Would anyone interpret it as a string? Ooh, OK. Where are the computer scientists? OK, great. So, um, so yeah, so the point is actually whoever said name. Way to go. All right. <laughs> Way to mind meld. OK, so, so if we look at, if we, if we have a little bit more information um, than just one um, row in our, in our data set, we might be able to interpret a little bit more. But there's two things I want to point out here, is that there's a difference between the interpretation that we make in the real world about what something means, the meaning behind that data, versus what we in computer science would think about as far as how we interpret that data to then be able to design tools and do something with it. So by semantics, we really mean these real world meanings where I'm going to interpret basal to be a name. And I have a, I have a lot of just an inherent experience about what that means. But the type is going to be our computational interpretation. And that's the thing that's really important that we in visualization design like to think about because then we can throw our whole set of the techniques and the encoding channels that Caddy was already talking about at these specific types um, of data that we have. And so what I'm going to focus on um, for the next couple minutes is the notion of type. 
So um, at a very high level, and I'm going to go through this part pretty quick, um, there's a number of data set types. Here we're talking about the whole data set that your, your, tr your, your typical sort of standard visualization techniques that I think most people in this room are familiar with work on. So the first one is tables. This is where you're going to have um, a set of items, which we typically think of as the rows, and you're going to have attributes, which we often think about as the columns. Um, and these things could be multidimensional. We represent them with things like scatter plots, bar charts, line charts, and so on. Um, another really common type is the notion of networks and trees. Here you have nodes with some sort of relationship between them that we often represent as edges. Um, a node link diagram is a really common way to look at this. Fields, for those of you that are working with uh, scientific data that might have volumes, um, these are where you have some sort of uh, continuous uh, representation um, over a discrete set of data that's represented as a grid. Here we might do something like volume rendering. And then also geometry, you know, so anyone who's working with GIS data, of course, you're going to have information about regions of space. Um, uh, Choropleths are a really common thing to look at that data with. Okay, so that's what we mean by data set types. But I think particularly um, interesting is the notion of attributes. So if you notice, um, at least for tables, networks, and fields, attributes shows up here. And these are really, you know, a, a set of types of measurements that describe interesting things about our items that we have in our data set. Um, and that's really, I think, where um, visual, visualization gets interesting um, and where the, um, the, the poster that Caddy had comes into play. And so let's talk a little bit about attributes. So when we think about attributes, we like to think about them in this way. So the first kind would be categorical, okay? And these are attributes that have no implicit ordering. My, things like my apples, oranges, bananas, and so on, okay? So that's what we would call a categorical. Um, then we have the class of ordered, and we have ordinal, where you have some sort of meaningful order, such as bronze, silver, and gold, right? Um, and then we have quantitative, where not only is it ordered, but now we, ha we can do, we have a meaningful magnitude, and we can do arithmetic on it, okay? Such as, like, temperature or height or something like that. Um, and so the reason that this is important is because this kind of categorization is really vital to how we end up choosing the kinds of visual encoding channels that we're going to use for our visualization, and I should note also, and Caddy alluded to this as well, is when we talk about um, ordinal and quantitative data, sometimes we can also talk about whether or not that ordering is sequential, diverging, or cyclic. But we're not going to really get into that much here today. Okay, so based upon that super fast summary, we're going to do an exercise. Okay, so if you'll notice, um, you have another packet that looks, the front page is like this. On the front page it says data types. And that is just a little reference sheet of the things I just talked about. I should note that um, these images are pulled from another um, textbook that I think is really wonderful by Tamara Munzner from UBC. On the second page, or no, sorry, the third page you can go to, you're going to see this image. And so what I would like you to do in a very fast two minutes is to get with a friend or two and to think about what kind of data types do you see on this coffee shop menu. I want you to just think a little bit about what are the things, you, you know, what are some of the different attributes? Would you consider them categorical, ordinal, quantitative, and so on? Okay, and so that, that, um, that cheat sheet there, it's really about looking at the attributes. So just spend two minutes talking with someone, see how many different attributes you can find. Okay, so um, to start with, does anyone want to share one of the attributes that they found? A tr let's come back to that. That's an advanced one. Okay. Okay, so, so, tem so temperatures, you're talking the, uh, the hot and the cold. And colder. Okay, so you would argue that you would call that, um, you would call that ordinal. An ordinal sequence. Okay. Would anyone call that anything else? Categorical. Why would you call it categorical? So, right. So it, 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 it kind of depends on the interpretation, right? Like I think there's a natural way to think about it as ordinal, but you could also argue it's categorical because maybe it's about choosing, and when, if, it, if my task is really about choosing a drink, maybe preference is really what I'm thinking about, and in this case, does it make sense to have something, is there more of a preference for hot or cold? It's a unique thing. And I think this is a really interesting point um, that uh, we'll revisit later in, at the end of the talk, which is this notion that 
data, we, we put all kinds of interpretation on top of data, and the way that we're going to operationalize it really depends on what we're trying to get out of it um, as designers or as data analysts. And so even though data comes to us and it seems like maybe the data is what it is, it turns out there's so much we can do to interpret it. Okay. So any other uh, attributes someone wants to mention? The price. Okay. Okay. Are we going to, let's, let's talk about price. So um, we, have a, we have a price up here, and what do we want to call that? Quantitative. Okay, right. Um, and, you know, I think most people would call it quantitative. Maybe I only have so much money in my wallet, and so I need to do some math to figure out what's the, the most, you know, amount I can get for the measly dollars that I have. Um, but, yeah. This sounds silly, but it's a real question. What about, so the, the value of the dollar changes, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so is it truly quantitative because the ounces are 16 ounces is 16 ounces? We're talking, we're talking about price, we're not talking about size Right, yet. right, but that's what I'm saying versus another obviously quantitative thing there. You could order, you know, a dollar, something like a dollar could change in value. Right? So, is that... so it turns out there is no right answer. Oh, okay. um, and, so, and, and so I think the idea here is really just to, just to be very purposeful and thoughtful in the way that we make decisions even about how we represent data because those decisions are going to then impact the way that we visualize it and ultimately interpret it. And so depending upon the kind of task that you have at 8 in the morning when you're trying to get a coffee and you're thinking about inflation, then maybe that is really important to you. Um, but for some of us, maybe, you know, maybe ordinal is just it, right? So, um, so I think that the, all of this comes into play as we're designing and it's about being thoughtful and making those decisions. Okay, one more. Anyone want to give one more attribute that we see? Someone had said something about size. Great. What would we call that? Quantitative. I heard ordinal. It could go. It's another one of these, right? It could go either way. Okay, great. Good. So that's just to get you guys primed and thinking about this. I swear this was the most boring part of the lecture. So... Okay, really quick because trust me, I got lot, I got, I got lots of good stuff. Okay, so, um, so, uh, okay, so let let's okay. So so now that we're thinking a little bit, we have a little bit of some language to talk about how we're rep how we think about data, how we represent it. Um, how how might you visually represent the numbers four and eight? And no, looking at the the poster that Caddy passed out. Do you accept fractions? What fractions? What do you? If how you would I visually represent that? Well, the the first question is: Do you only accept whole numbers or fractions? Oh, okay, sure. And so, but uh, uh, let's just assume we're just working with whole numbers to keep this simple for now. Okay. Uh, two dice. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so visually, how would I represent how would I represent the numbers four and eight? They're just you know, it could be five and ten, it could be three and eleven. What are some ways I could use to visually represent that? Dots. And and by dots, what do we mean? Like four dots for four versus eight dots for for. Okay. Great. So I have a number of marks, and each one um, sums up. It's sort of like a histogram. Yeah. Cuatro and ocho. Okay, and another one. But you, you guys are you guys are feisty. Okay, um, any any other ideas? Uh, okay, so so length. Someone else said size. I think that's a very interesting word to use. That we're going to come back to. Someone said area, right? Pies. So so maybe maybe the percentage that four and eight is out of twelve, for example. If I wanted to talk about parts of a whole. Right? So pie slices are, are really about angle. Yep. Any other ideas? Density of color. Density of color. Okay. So we might talk about something like intensity or saturation. Yep. Okay, great. So this represents them on a graph with four at the base and eight above it. Okay, so so what Okay, so so what you're actually talking about is using you're actually talking about using a spatial encoding, okay? In this case, it happens to be um, position along a vertical axis, regardless of what your baseline is. Yep. Okay, so that gets into to thinking, into being able to talk a little bit more structured. 
about the visual encoding channels that we can actually use. Now, here, these are a subset that are uh, taken, that are from the chart, the, the larger set that Caddy showed you. These are the subset um, that we know a lot about from perceptual studies, um, and that um, you would, that are, make up the, the bulk of the standard types of visualizations that we see out in the world today. Okay, and so on the left, we have all the visual encoding channels that, um, that are useful for showing either uh, quantitative data or ordinal data. Okay, these are things like position on a common scale, length, area, color saturation, and so on. On the right, we have the encoding channels that are um, mostly used for showing categorical. So we have things like um, different shapes or different hues or even spatial region. Now, we also know um, a lot about these uh, encoding channels, and we know with pretty good evidence which ones are most effective for interpreting information. So it turns out, if we're just talking about numbers, quantitative values, um, the positional channels, such as um, position on an axis or length or things like that, are like the most effective channels that we can use, as opposed to something like color, which shows up at the bottom. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a little bit. So, so where, do, where do these rankings come from? Well, as I said, um, we actually have a lot of pretty good evidence from controlled lab studies that have looked at the effectiveness of different channels. So some of the early work in this was done in the 80s by a couple of statisticians, Cleveland and McGill, um, where they did some of the first perceptual studies on understanding these different encoding channels. Um, this work was replicated just um, a number of years ago by um, Hare and Bostock, where they actually used Mechanical Turk to do um, replication studies, and they got the same results. So based upon that, plus some of the, you know, it's not just these studies. The rankings come from a variety of other sources as well. But th this is one of the primary sources for that. And so I'll, I'll just exemplify this a little bit so you can get a feeling for yourself about these rankings so you don't just have to take my word for it. So if I show you these two bars, A and B, how much longer is B than A? Four times. Any other thoughts? Great. The answer is, in fact, four times. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? So here we're encoding with length. How much larger is B than A? Three times. Any other thoughts? Four times. Five. Six. Seven. Okay. It turns out we have to say, well, what do we mean by size? Okay. So if we're talking about the diameter of the circles, B is two times the size of A. If we're talking about the area, it's actually four times. Okay? A little bit harder to do, right? Not to mention it's ill-defined. How much darker is B than A? <laughs> Let's say it's on a scale from white to black. Any guesses? It is actually two times. Yep, but I'm guessing you were guessing. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm going to give you one more example of this. Um, and uh, this, I, how many of you have seen a visualization like this before? Okay, right. So, so this, this is called a heat map, and this is probably one of the most common visualizations that you would find in biology. Open any biology journal, you're going to see this, often for looking at gene expression. Um, the, the way that it's encoded is we have a matrix layout um, of rows of attributes, both along the columns and the rows, and then values are encoded with color in the cells. How many people in here are red, green, colorblind? One woman, it should be 10% of the men. All right, so you just see a sea of like yellow and black or something. Right, okay. So, um, so color is really, really interesting. And um, in fact, I think Caddy made a really interesting point earlier, which is, you know, is this color map a bad decision? Well, it turns out that the reason that these things are red green come from some interesting historic regions or reasons in biology that had to do with the way that people used to measure gene expression through phosphorescing proteins. So there was a lot of good contextual knowledge, and people just knew what red mean and what and what green meant, even though 10% of people couldn't see it. So so sometimes you're making interesting decisions in visualization that aren't necessarily always just decisions based upon perceptual principles. So, okay, so, so this is a really standard kind of visualization. Here I'm showing you a very simplified version. I'm showing you seven little time series, and each time series has six time points. Okay, and so low, green is low values, red are high, and time is encoded along the horizontal axis. So looking at these, can you tell which ones are, um, behave similarly? Which ones have peaks and valleys in the same place? Or perhaps a little more challenging, which ones are uh, 
time shifted off of each other? Whew, yeah, that's hard, right? But what if I encode it like this? We're now, instead of using color to encode, I'm using position along the vertical axis. Those kind of nuanced tasks are way easier for us to perform. Because it turns out that translating changes in position is more natural for us than cha translating changes in color, OK? And so, so this, is, this is some of the, the underlying guidance behind how we choose effective visual encodings. OK, so another fast exercise. What we're going to do, so if you'll notice, page two is that chart of encoding channels that we just talked about, along with our effectiveness rating. And then on page four, you're going to see an image like this. This is an infographic that I think is really fun. Um, and what, um, what we're looking at here are a bunch of dog breeds. Um, the creators have, have, have um, created what they call our data score, which has to do with intelligence plus longevity plus ailments plus cost minus grooming and appetite. I don't understand the, the metric here, but whatever. It's a data score. OK. so. <laughs> What, what I want you to do is, again, in a group and spend about two minutes, I want you to try to say what attributes are being shown and what encoding channel is being used to show them. OK, so, all right, so anyone want to name one, one attribute that they found and how it's being visually encoded? Intelligence, Intelligence. great. <laughs> Direction or orientation, exactly. Great, another one. Type, right. The, um, uh, yes, I guess breeds are broken or categorized into different types, and that's using color. Anything else? Popularity. Or wait, let, let's stay on type for a second. Okay, so we said color. Okay, size, yeah. So, the, so there's sort of a redundant encoding with color and with the size of the icon. You know what? The data score didn't make sense either. So <laughs> I'm not claiming like accuracy here, right? But um, right. So so is there anything else about the way that they're encoding type here? Is it just shape? Exactly. So so this is what we would call a redundant encoding. Okay. So it's really about using the shape as well as the color to really accentuate and make sure that we can recognize those different types of um, types. Okay. Complicated. So maybe not, maybe not the best of legends, right? OK. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so is there a different way that maybe they should have done that legend for the type? There are a lot of different things. There's a lot of different things. OK. All right. OK, so what's, what's another attribute that's being encoded here? Popularity. Popularity. And how is that being encoded? Position along the vertical scale. Exactly. OK. What's another one? Data score. Data score. And what's that being coded as? Positionality along the XY axis. Exactly. Position, al exactly. position along, the, uh, along the horizontal. Exactly. Great. Um, all right. Did, um, did, did anyone find the outlier? The cat. The cat. The cat. Yeah. I'm a cat person. OK. Um, is, is there anything else? Is there anything else being encoded here? Right, so there, there's some sort of um, categorization that's going on based upon the quadrant where these, these different marks fall into, right? There's the hot dog, the overlooked treasures, rightfully ignored, and the inexplicably overrated. So, so what do you guys think about this visualization? OK, so if you have a, an opinion, you have to justify it. Anyone want to have an opinion and justify it? OK, so colorblind folks aren't such a big fan of, of this, at least, at least for how to look at the type, right? Yeah. The, the size of the dog is confounded. Right, so what did they do? Right, so, so it's a little bit ambiguous what size is actually encoding here, right? Is it encoding the type? Or is it encoding something about that actual breed? It's a little unclear. Yeah. They're adding, to create this aggregate data score, they're adding incommensurate units. Yeah. <laughs> I, the, yeah. The, the, the data score is a little wonky. 
Right, I agree. I totally agree. Okay, great. So, so the point of this exercise, um, the point of this exercise was just to uh, let you guys sort of flex your your muscles and in how and how do we how can we um, reason about the way a visualization is put together? Um, I think this goes back nicely to Caddy's point about this notion of visualization literacy. And part of it is just being able to read. Can we read a visualization? Can we pull apart what, how, what kind of data it's encoding? Can we then critique it? Um, and then ultimately, I think what that leads into is for us being able to more thoughtfully design visualizations for our own data. Um, one thing that we're not going to get to, but there is one more um, visualization in this packet that I encourage you on your own after this. If you want to take a look at it, do the same thing. I shouldn't have showed you, because now you guys are going to all stare at this and be like, it's terrible. But just, uh, um, I will say, this is a visualization I saw a couple of years ago in a Delta um, Sky magazine. So, OK, so it existed in the world. All right, so really quick, I just want to give you guys, um, I just want to very quickly give you just a few, you know, we have many, many guidelines and principles in the, in the visualization community that are based upon um, a lot of knowledge and studies that we've done. But here I'm just going to give you a few that I think are ones that you can use right away in your own um, visualization work. The first one is around color. So it turns out color is really, really, really hard, and people love it. People love to use color. Um, in fact, I spend, um, I don't I, Caddy's probably the same. I spent an entire week just dissecting why color is so challenging. Um, I think this, um, this one diagram, I think, does a pretty good job of capturing what some of the main problems are with color. Um, so some of the problems with color is that it interacts with what's in this background. So if you look at these first two um, images that are labeled A and B, um, you'll see that in A, those two middle bars are actually the same color but because of the background that they're placed against, the purple versus the yellow, they look different, or they should. Um, and then conversely, in B, you see that those two brown bars in the middle look kind of um, the same, but when you actually put them next to each other, you see that they're very different. What's really compelling is that C, um, the, um, there's a, a designer named Bang Wong who, who wrote about this in a Nature Methods column, and he actually pulled that heat map from a publication, a scientific publication, and the two bits, the two little red bars, pink bars that have the asterisks are the same shade. Okay, so, so one of the things about color is that it interacts with the colors that surround it. Okay, so it's very, very difficult for us to be able to make accurate judgments um, about color um, in a data visualization. There are, there are several things in which color is very good for, but in general, a good rule of thumb is to get it right in black and white. Okay, if you can avoid using color, I recommend doing it. Okay. Let's also talk about 3D, because um, this actually is something that comes up, I, I get asked questions quite a bit about, is the use of 3D, right? So if, if you think back to, the, um, to these uh, encoding channels and the rankings, you see that both for um, magnitude and ordered as well as for categorical, uh, uh, spatial encoding is at the top, okay? That's our strongest encoding channel. So if, if spatial encoding is best, and I have one dimension and the two dimensions, then third dimension must be awesome too, okay? But it turns out there's some real challenges with, with using 3D, particularly on a digital interface. So take this little example. Um, I, ha, okay, confession time, how many people have made a 3D bar chart? I did, once. Okay, um, so what value does the red bar for the females equal? Oh, it's so clear, right? So it turns, it turns out that a lot, a lot of the um, things that we have to do in a computer in order to make something look 3D, whether it's um, per, uh, perspective or shading or things like that, actually interfere with some of our encoding channels like color and size and stuff like that. Okay, so those things interact. Um, but the, another thing that's really problematic about 3D is the fact that data is obscured. So this is actually an image that I pulled from a advertising page for some sort of piece of visualization software. Um, and this is actually a 3D node link diagram. And again, you know, anyone in here who's worked with graphs and visualization knows that this is incredibly challenging. In fact, there is a whole research community called graph drawing just because it's so hard. Um, and so there's this temptation to just use that third dimension to help pull apart my data set. 
But the challenge here is that what's going on behind the things that you see? There's like a whole other part of this visualization that you can't see unless you start rotating it. So there's no way to see the entire data set in a single view, and it requires using interaction. Okay, so, so the fact that data is going to be obscured in a 3D view is also really challenging. So in general, what we try to do is stay in the plane. Okay, so stay in the 2D plane. All right, and one more quick guideline has to do with animation. Okay, so, so um, uh, a lot of times we use animation to encode things that have a temporal component to the data set, right? It's sort of a natural thing. If I have time as one of my attributes, I'm going to encode that attribute with time. So I'm going to have an animation that goes over time. Um, well, let's look at this little video. I'll even let, uh, well, no, we're just going to, we're just going to watch it. And then I'll ask you my question. Okay, how many different shapes did you see? Okay, look at that. So, so the point here is that it turns out that we have very, very limited short-term working memory, and part of the point of visualization is to offload some of that, um, some of, the, some of the, the cognitive limitations we have into the externalization. But with an animation, you're required to hold many, many things in your mind at once. And then being able to make comparisons across them is very hard. So instead, one of the techniques we use a lot in the Viz community is something called small multiples. This is an example of that, where um, I would show, in this case, you know, the, the data, the time steps that I've decided are the important ones. I show them in a repeated small multiple visualization so that I can just quickly, just by moving my eyes, scan across and make those fine-grained comparisons that would be you know, potentially impossible to do in the video itself. Now, as a, as a quick aside, because I love this dinosaur video, um, this was created by, um, this is uh, some recent work by a couple of researchers at Autodesk who created an algorithm in order to generate um, visually different but statistically the same sets of data. So in that video, in this video, every single one of these data sets, including the transitions, has roughly, I think it's up to the fourth decimal point, the same median, mean, and linear regression. Okay, and so their, their point, <laughs> right, so they had, they had an algorithm to do this, and the point there is really to drive home the idea that um, statistics can be great and it can be powerful, but sometimes it can hide really important and meaningful things in the data, and that's one of the power, of, one of the things that makes visualization really compelling. Okay, so um, in this case, for our animation guideline, the, eye, the idea is eyes over memory. You know, we're, 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 our eyes and our perceptual system is way more powerful than our short-term working memory. Okay, and so what I want to quickly talk about, and it's only going to be a couple of minutes because this is like my, this is, this is the thing I care about most, is the fact that, you know, what we've been talking about here is the idea of we have encoding channels and I have data and I'm going to do this mapping and it's all great. But I'm guessing that, you know, for a lot of you in here who are working with data and have tried to make visualizations, the... There's this really hard part, which is just even understanding what am I trying to visualize in my data? You know, what can I extract from my data that's going to help me make sense of, of whatever my problem is? And so here's where I really like to argue that visualization is not just about these rules for encoding, but it's also a process, a design process. Um, the, the process that we use in my group at a very high level looks like this, where we spend a lot of time understanding the problems that our collaborators have. We then spend time ideating on how we can represent that data and then how we could encode it. We make a lot of very rapid prototypes to try ideas, and then we deploy them into the wild to really get a sense of how they impact the world. And the really important thing here is the fact that we are evaluating with our collaborators at every single step. So it's a very close working um, um, process. And so anyone here who's done any sort of user-centered design, this kind of thing looks and feels very familiar. So this is actually, you know, a more honest portrayal of this, this, this process. And again, as sort of Caddy was saying, this is incredibly iterative, right? We're, we're creating visualizations that we're refining our questions. Sometimes that leads to a whole new set of questions we never would have thought of. But in this, I think there's, you know, this one really, really compelling phase, and this is about understanding, which is what in the world is the problem that I'm trying to design a, a visualization solution for? And so we use um, a lot of qualitative as well as design methods in our group. Um, we do interviews and observations, contextual inquiry, participatory design methods, a whole bunch of stuff that we can throw at this problem in order to structure this process and to do it in as rigorous of a way as possible. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you a feeling for, you know, this is a little, uh, little comic about what it feels like at the start of this understand phase. 
So on the left, I have a scientist, and on the right, I have a viz person. And the viz person says, what do you want to visualize? And the scientist says, oh, well, from patterns of conservation, we want to visualize the mechanisms that influence gene regulation. And to a viz person, this is kind of how it sounds to us. Okay? So, so I poke fun at this, but, but it's actually not so far from the truth. And, and I actually think that um, the, sort of open, the, um, the sort of open, unbiased perspective that a viz designer brings to the problem is part of what allows visualization to make big impacts and to disrupt the work of data analysts. So how do we, so, so the, the goal though in this, in this early phase of the design process is that we want to be able to operationalize real world goals into actionable tasks, tasks that we can design a visualization for. And so by actionable, what I mean is I want tasks that directly reference the data that I have. Okay, so let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Let's say I had this real world challenge of I wanted to identify good movie directors. Okay, that, that's my real world goal. Well, that's a kind of fuzzy, ill-defined task. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, <laughs> right. And so, um, and so um, one of the things that um, I've been working on with a colleague is, is a, um, a framework for how to break apart a real uh, a semantically rich task like this um, and how to start to operationalize that. And we do it by thinking about breaking our task into these components. So the first one is the action. So you want to identify the action, which is the thing you want to do the object, which is the items you want to take that action on, and then finally the measure, which is the value that you're interested in for those objects. Okay, so if we go to our example, my action is to identify. What is it I want to identify? I want to identify film directors. Okay, well, maybe it turns out that the data set I have is I scrape data from IMDb. So my data, my data items are actually movies, which have a director attribute, but so my data isn't directly about directors. Ha, ha, ha. It's about movies. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a proxy. And I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to assume really that my objects are about movies, because that's what I have in my data. But if I can learn something about movies, then I can infer something about the directors, which is really the goal that I had. All right, so now, what is it that I want to measure? I want to, I, I, I want to find good directors. What does good mean? IMDb score? Is that the right answer? No. Right. Maybe it's 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 amount of money someone's made. Maybe it's the number of movies someone's made. Maybe it's the the demographics that someone has reached. Okay. So this notion of measures is is a lot of times where we have this very subjective interpretation of our data because we have to find proxies as they relate to our data to approximate something about the world that we're trying to get at. And so in this case, I'm just going to say, you know, good is going to be a high IMDb rating. And so by finding these components and identifying proxies that actually are in the data, I can translate this, this task into identify movies with high IMDb ratings. Now, based upon the data set I have, this is something that I can actually design a computational tool to support. Okay? And, and so, so that's, that's a big part of the understand phase that we go through is trying to identify these sorts of tasks. Um, and the way that we do this, as I said before, is we do, um, we do a lot of interviews. Um, we do exploratory data analysis on our own to get a sense of what's in there. We also do a lot of rapid prototyping to get ideas out um, to our collaborators. And we, we've started to call this process roughly data counseling because it's not so unlike going to a counselor where you're trying to pull out the deep-seated needs that someone has that they can't really quite articulate yet. Um, that, I feel like, is, is one of my major roles in this world. Okay, so from, the, you know, going back to this, this exa example, yeah, question? The one thing that's missing from the task for me is why, because you can't identify their need or what they mean by good unless you know why they want to identify or do whatever they do. And that's exactly where data counseling comes in. So myself as the, as the viz designer, this is assuming that I'm designing tools for someone else. My role through data counseling is try to help them articulate that why, to articulate, well, what does good mean for your problem? And it turns out a lot of times it could be a whole bunch of things, right? It's, it's, it's oftentimes it's not so easy as it's just this attribute is what good means to me. It can sometimes be a relationship between many things, which is one of the reasons why exploratory visualization can be really powerful. And so if we go back to this example, through a data counseling process, we were able to determine that by gene regulation, they really meant they had a set of time series. By patterns of conservation, they were interested in patterns, temporal patterns across those time series. 
And by mechanisms is they really wanted to understand those patterns in the context of a binary tree. So we can take, um, we can take that um, result and then design a visualization, um, in this case, a representation to specifically support that data. Okay, so just as a quick wrap up, um, what we talked about is just some nuts and bolts about how we think about the rep how we represent data and then how that applies to inform the kinds of visual encodings that we have at hand to use to create visualizations. Um, we talked about that the visual encodings are ranked, which is really, really great. Um, I gave you a few guidelines to, um, to fall on, which is get it right in black and white, stay in the plane, and eyes over memory. And then also that visualization um, itself is a design process. Um, so along with the reading that Caddy had already put up, I had a few additional things that I, I like to recommend. Um, the first one um, is an O'Reilly book by Noah Linsky and Julie Steele called Designing Data Visualizations. This is just, I think, a good nuts and bolts, like, okay, I have some data. What are my different kinds of uh, visual representations and visual encodings? What are some good guidelines? You can read it in an afternoon. The second one, Visualization Analysis and Design, is by Tamara Munzner. That's where I've pulled the, um, the data types and the rankings from. This is a textbook that many of us in the community use in our viz courses. Um, it's very, very dense, but very, very thorough. Um, the next one over is a new book that um, my colleague at Microsoft Research and I just put out this winter um, that really tries to encapsulate this operationalization process and the role that visualization plays in that. Um, and then finally, I think the, the one that usually surprises people is the Non-Designers Design book by Robin Williams, a designer, a woman, not the comedian. Um, this book kind of just fundamentally changed my life when I read it. Um, I highly encourage you to check it out. You will never make visualizations or presentations in the same way after reading it. That's my contact info, and that's, I guess we're ready to have a discussion.